there's good news for you. There will be a day where there will be no more memory verses. <laughs> and that's when Jesus returns, right? Uh, but what else, that was one of the toughest I found this year. A lot of tongue twisters and, and what have you. Uh, but a very powerful, profound message that is there. Uh, so today we want to continue to look to the Lord. It's one week before Christmas. I hope you're excited. I know many of us have planned uh, gatherings, you know, and this is a tremendous opportunity for us to just bring the presence of Jesus to others. And we, I believe that the word today will strengthen you uh, as you do so. Uh, let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise that indeed you send your son Jesus in the first advent. Lord, our hearts cannot be filled enough with the gratitude. Lord, the gratitude of the Savior, Emmanuel, God made man incarnate in order for us to look forward to that day. And Lord, even though some of us may be going through struggles, sicknesses, grieving, uh, Father, we want to pray that the hope of Christmas will come alive in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, my friends, we often focus on Mary and her role in the birth of Jesus Christ. Today, we want to reflect on the part that Joseph played in the first advent, and he played a very significant role. From the narrative of Joseph, we can gather insights into the dilemma that obedience poses, and also find inspiration for our own response to the Emmanuel of Christmas. And that's the trust of our message today, that we want to realize that God is developing us, God is molding us. One thing that we look forward to especially in the week leading on to Christmas, is the knowledge that God is changing us. God is transforming us and God is making us better. But there are situations sometimes that causes us uh, to break away and get discouraged. And so this is something that we want to look to the Lord doing in our hearts. Do you know which statue in the United States is one of the most photographed? Many people, locals and tourists alike, have gone out of the way to pay this monument a visit. It has also been said that touching the foot of the famous sculpture would actually bring you luck. Interestingly, it happens to also be known as the Statue of Three Lies. The statue is found in Harvard Yard, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the world-renowned Harvard University. It is a monument of John Howard. A plaque states there, John Howard, founder, 1638. John Howard, founder, 1638. John Howard was a Puritan clergy who gave 780 pounds and more significantly, 320 volumes of scholarly writings from his personal library to the school. After he died, the university commissioned Darren Chatterster French to create this statue, the statue that still appears today. So why is it known as the statue of the three lies? First of all, the artist commissioned to create it could not find a picture of John Harvard. So he chose a picture of a respectable looking gentleman and from there he created this sculpture. Second, John Howard was not the founder of Harvard University. He was simply a substantial contributor to the college. Third, the date of the statue's base was not the date of John Howard's death, nor the year of the university's founding, as might suppose, but the year he donated the library and the money to the university. That is why this is known as the Statue of the Three Lies. What is the lesson, my friends? What we see is not necessarily the truth. What we see is not necessarily the truth. We need to go deeper at times. This is what we want to do today. Go deeper into the character of the Advent story that we seldom think much of. Joseph. Joseph. And discover the journey he took required submission and sacrifice. My friends, we cannot take for granted the feeling that Joseph went through. When his fiance told him she was pregnant, put herself in his shoes for a moment. The man had honored his relationship by staying pure, and now he was faced with an incomprehensible shock. The most natural instinct when your fiance comes to you and says, 
she's pregnant and you know you didn't do anything, is probably the thought, lies, 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 and more lies. His relationship with Mary, was it built on a lie? Mary was lying, certainly. A virgin pregnancy, very impossible, unheard of. Could Joseph at that point accept and live with Mary's reason? So we enter into Joseph's world through the narrative of Matthew. For those of us who might not have known, what differentiates between the Gospel of Matthew to Luke is Matthew tells the story of the birth of Jesus from the standpoint of Joseph. From his standpoint rather than Mary. We see it in the different genealogies these gospel writers recorded. Matthew writes Joseph's genealogy, Luke's focuses on Mary's. And in an Advent narrative, Luke spends a lot of time sharing about Mary's experience with such stories as the appearance of the angel, her joy as she experienced and visited Elizabeth, and her song when she wrote, My spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour, for He has regarded the lowly state of His servant. So Luke describes the exuberance, the joy of Mary. Matthew, when you read this gospel, simply put and recorded, Mary became pregnant due to an activity of the Holy Spirit and goes on to tell his readers what Joseph felt and did. A bit anticlimax. But this is why the gospel complements each other. They don't contradict, but instead they give us a fuller picture of what happened about Jesus, about the people in the first advent and how the advent affected them. And today, about Joseph. And this is the story of Joseph and the baby Jesus. Matthew 1, verse 18 to 19. Let me read it for us again. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Think about this verse a little bit deeper. Matthew does not tell the reader who Joseph and Mary were. He presumes that we know this. Similarly, he does not speak explicitly to justify the virgin birth. He finds that to be an unnecessary detail. But he does emphasize something, something very important. The matter of the engagement. The word betrothed indicates a firm commitment. A firm commitment normally undertaken one year before a Hebraic marriage. It was firm. It was confirmed. It was as good as done. It was a sealed deal. And during that year, the girl remained with her own family, but the established tie was a strong one, and this was really the first stage of a Hebrew marriage, being betrothed. A betrothed woman could be punished as an adulteress if she was found to be unfaithful. How do we know that? Well, Joseph would have known it. Matthew would have known it. Because in the book of Deuteronomy, it speaks about this. So in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 23 to 24, it reads, If there is a betrothed virgin, ah, that's Mary. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out of the gate of the city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So the Hebraic laws set standards for marriage and speaks about how a betrothed woman, if she gets into a situation and she did not cry out for help, in other words, she was agreeable to that situation, then you have to be stoned. And so Jesus encountered that. Remember, the woman who was brought in adult, caught in adultery was brought before him to be stoned. And this is, this is where the Hebraic law came to being. Imagine the nation had no laws 
and no restrictions, no boundaries. And God in His wisdom had to provide that law. But the point is this, this was the penalty of what happened when a betrothed woman gets into a situation. The punishment, on the other hand, of a virgin who is not betrothed was different. So you look again at Deuteronomy. So 22, verse 28 to 29, reads, If a man meets a woman or a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all the days. My friends, come back to the event story. That Mary became pregnant before they came together was very serious. As Joseph's attitude made clear. Matthew's Jewish readers would have known how serious it was. Matthew the Jew would have known how serious it was. Joseph would have known how serious it was. Joseph could have applied the law and made it clear to his families, to the authorities, to society, and he would have been justified. He was described instead by Matthew as a just man because the law was by his side and he was careful to observe the law, but he chose to let Mary go quietly without judgment, without embarrassment. And there is a very important twist in the Advent narrative that made Joseph a just man. Not that he did not know the law, not that he did not apply the law, but he was just because he did something different. I like how a commentator describes the situation. He says, Joseph being just, so that he was unable to consummate the marriage, but he did not want to be harsh. Perhaps we should say that for Joseph, being just before God included an element of mercy. The just man is compassionate. The just man is compassionate. Just like Jesus did when the adulterous woman was brought before him. He had every right to be the judge. He had every right to cast the stone because he was the righteous one. But one thing that we learn in the trait of Joseph was similar to that what was found in the trait of Jesus is this that you may have all the rights to judge, all the rights to be angry, all the rights not to forgive. But the just man is also given an opportunity to be merciful and compassionate. Joseph avoided an open scandal. He could have made a public display of his anger by taking Mary before the law. He could have humiliated the woman. He preferred to divorce her secretly. Divorce was possible for an Israelite man. He could give the lady a bill of divorce before two witnesses and send her away. Again, Deuteronomy tells us that. Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favour in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it on her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. It was right. It was justified. It was acceptable in society uh, for, for man to divorce his wife. And Joseph was in the position where he had the moral high ground to break off the relationship. His betrothed was pregnant and it had nothing to do with him. At that point, before divine revelation, Joseph already showed a godly trait. Justice also involves mercy. Wow. You and I know people can hurt us. Lies, lies, lies can be said against us. Lies, lies, lies can exist can exist in a family relationship. Even the relationship between a husband and a wife. And sometimes, 
anger can be justified. And you may have every right not to forgive. The person who hurt you may never be able to give you a good reason why the trespass was done. Virgin birth? That's never happened before. Who are you trying to kid? Joseph acted justly before the angelic intervention. Wronged seemingly, he acted with compassion. Compassion. This advent, my friends, do we need to act in the same manner towards someone? And when you decide to, God can work things out just as He did for Joseph. Matthew wrote in verse 20 to 21, but as Joseph considered these things, he was pondering. He was probably worried. He was probably concerned. What do I do? He was probably confused. As he considered these things, he was probably getting emotional as well, you know, knowing the situation. As he considered these things, the Bible tells us, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Wow. Nothing is said about the appearance of the angel or anything he did as Luke does. Attention is concentrated on the message. He addresses Joseph as the son of David. And this term is loaded. The most esteemed king in history, Israel's history, David, was promised by Yahweh that he would have a descendant who would rule forever and ever. This was the promise that was given to David. The angel at this point reminded Joseph there and then that he would be participating in making history and fulfilling prophecy if he would obey. Joseph, son of David. And the message goes on to say, do not fear. And when it says do not fear, it does not mean don't be afraid, like what we are used to understanding this term. But the word carry with it the sense of do not string back from doing something. Do not let fear prevent you from action, from doing something. Commentators observe that throughout Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2, it is Joseph who does what needs to be done. Wow. Just read it for yourself. Matthew 1 and Matthew chapter 2. It was Joseph who was hard carrying the family through tough times, through situations, through persecution. It was Joseph who does what needs to be done. And you know what? Usually the will of God requires great resolve, setting aside our own plans and desires. Joseph does what was required of him. In the same way, this Advent, my friends, one week before Christmas, is there something that God has placed in your heart that you just have to do? You just have to act? Perhaps... God has already placed that in your heart. And then the angel goes on to highlight the objective of Joseph's obedience and what it will fulfill. The child will save humanity from their sin. You know, those of you who think very deeply about the Bible, um, Matthew does not use the word sin very often. In fact, if you look at the Matthew Gospel, he only uses it seven times. But the usage here shows an important emphasis. Jesus came to deal with sin, and His name gives expression to an important truth. And I like what John Barclay said. He said, Jesus was not so much the man born to be king as the man born to be saviour. Wow. I hope you are grateful today, my friends, that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but in the first advent, totally, absolutely nothing else was primary but the fact that He came to save you and I, to take away the sin 
and our lives. Joseph's task was to put aside his personal struggles, society's norm, religious conformity, to be part of a miracle, to be a vessel of God's great redemption plan. And so, verse 22 to 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So the Bible tells us, in due course, Joseph woke up, and he did what the angel told him to do. He took Mary as his wife. He did not have sexual relationship with him until Jesus was born, and the narrative ends with these words, and Joseph called his name Jesus. And I'll close with this point. Because this is a very powerful point. Let me read that again. Joseph called his name Jesus. You know, just now we just sang about Jesus being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come back to this phrase. And Joseph called his name Jesus. You know, get it into your spirit, guys. Get into your spirit this phrase. Joseph called his name Jesus. Are you getting it? Joseph called his name Jesus. As Zacharias did with John, Joseph named the baby Jesus. The name above all names, the baby who will take away the sins of the world was declared Jesus by Joseph. This is a profound picture of what obedience is. The will of God fulfilled through an ordinary human being acting on behalf of the Almighty. And Joseph called his name Jesus. And my friends, that's powerful. You see, the first advent is about ordinary people with ordinary struggles. And when you consider Joseph, the emotions he went through are some of the emotions and the pain that we go through. Lies, lies, lies. Confusion, confusion, confusion. What did I do wrong? And sometimes before God's intervention, we get in those seasons of frustrations, of hurts, of grieving. But when we choose to obey, when we choose to let go, when we choose to forgive, God, through your ordinary action, makes in an extraordinary supernatural intervention. The will of God fulfilled through a human being acting on behalf of the Almighty. Go invite the team to come forward as I close. You know, church, you know, Sierra, one week before Christmas, I hope you're looking forward, not just to your parties, but looking forward to what God is doing in your life. Wow. And He's doing something in you. Every experience that you have gone through this year, whether it's work, whether it's grief, you lost someone who is important to you, whether it's a struggle with a sickness or a problem, when we decide not to be afraid, not to string back from doing things for God, this is usually when God acts through us. You may be a leader in your organization, an educator, a head of your household, a faithful employer, a mom or a dad. What differentiates you from someone who has no relationship with God is this. God is doing something in and through you. And God will give you great ideas from His throne room to hard carry your team, to hard carry your family, to hard carry those who have problems, to hard carry those who are grieving, to have a different spirit, 
to bring the presence of the Emmanuel right into your workplace, right into your situations, right into broken relationships. Not just with a justified act, but with acts of mercy and compassion. This is what happened to Joseph at the first advent. The man fought against his natural instinct. He had religion behind him. He had the laws behind him. But he considered. And when God revealed his will, he acted. This can happen to you and me. Church, would you stand? And in an attitude of prayer, would you consider what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you? You know what He speaks? He speaks words of love, but also words of conviction. He's the counselor and He's the guide of your situation. And I don't know what you're going through, but I know right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in your situation personally because He's a God who speaks and He's a God who loves you and He's a God who is drawing you into Himself. And there's some of you today where you have to let go of that unforgiveness. Where you have to let go of that grief. You have to let go of that pain. Because when you do so, the healing of God will come into your life. The freedom of the Holy Spirit will begin to flow. The power of God will come upon you. You know, some of you, God has put you as leaders in your team and leaders in your industry, but you've been holding back. You've been afraid, you've been faith, fearful of speaking out, of living by God's principles and God's precepts. Today, God wants to say to you, do not be afraid. I will make you a man and a woman, not just of words, but a man and a woman of spirit. As I make you a man and a woman of the spirit, you'll be a man and a woman of the action of the Lord. The acts of the Lord will be seen through you. Today, the anointing of the Lord is here to set you free from your fears, your inhibition, but you must be as Joseph. Say, God, 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 I will. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. So Holy Spirit, right now, for every person in every situation, I pray that your ministry of your Holy Spirit will be very real. I just feel in my heart that some of you are grieving, grieving for loved ones, grieving for a life of regret, of things that you have not done. Let it go to the Lord. Let it go to the Lord and let Him do a work of change. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Shakala bada shiriyare. Shikiriyare yara bada yara yara yara. Spirit of the living God, come in awe of your power. Bring us a visitation. Meet us where we are. And we pray that the powerful name of Jesus will begin to set your people free free into your purpose, free into your plan, free into your will, free into your grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. As a team lead us in this song, Potter's Hand, this morning would you give your life to Jesus and to your heavenly Father and say, here I am, Lord, the clay. Make me as you are. Call me as you will. Use me for the glory of your name.